turn to Ephesians chapter 3. I want to start there this morning. So we were looking at the Ephesian church, and I'm not going to go back into everything that we've been saying, but uh, what we've seen is that, uh, 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 that in the Ephesian church, God has raised up this church. They became a powerful church. They've done so many things. And um, at this point, Paul is speaking to this church, and this church has been growing. This church has been uh, on the upward rise in what they were doing. And Paul was kind of explaining to them that they were Ephesians, they were Gentiles, and that they were not a part of the Jewish and so on. But through Christ, we were all made one. Remember last week I was speaking about that. We all became one. We are one in Christ. And that the two became one. And now we are the church. We're not Jews and Gentiles. We are now the church. And God has created the church. He has designed the church. He has, he has uh, uh, purposed the church for a specific task. And when we look in chapter 3, I just want to end, uh, read the end of chapter 2 quickly. Um, he says in chapter 2, verse, let's take verse 17. Or no, yeah, verse 16. And in this one body to reconcile both to them, both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. So he says, you are no longer strangers, but you are fellow workers, fellow children, fellow people, you know, members of God's household. He actually makes it a household. You know, you became part of a household. Every Friday I come to Anton's house and then I eat with them, I do, I'm uninvited, I just rock up, <laughs> and I eat pancakes and everything with the kids, so I just become part of the household, <laughs> you know, that's what God kind of, He made us part of His household, it's so powerful, um, He says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which Christ Jesus Himself, as the chief cornerstone, in Him the whole building is joined together, and raised to become a holy temple in the Lord. So he's talking about the church, and he says it's, it's a household, it's a family, and it's a building that's being built. We're going to build as well. It's a building that's being built together, and it's not talking about a physical building, but as a body, a building being built together with Christ as the cornerstone, everything around, revolving around Him. In Him the whole building is joined together, and, and, and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. We all are being becoming this building in which God lives by His Holy Spirit, you know. And as a church, we need to realize that we are this building, that God is building. And I know these things sound... Uh, uh, I, I know you kind of know all these things, you know about these things, you know, that that's why we as the church, we've got so many better promises and better deals and better covenants with God. And uh, we have all, sh we are all sharing in all the old covenants as well. Um, so let's start with chapter 3. Now Paul starts with, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, um, so he starts out, he says, for this reason, there's a reason why he's writing this, why he's saying this. For this reason, I pull the prisoner of Christ Jesus for, this, for the sake of you Gentiles. He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He, uh, at that point, he was in prison. He was writing to the church. He was in prison in Rome, and he's writing to the church in Ephesus. And he uses the analogy of a prisoner, but he was not a prisoner in prison. He was a prisoner for Christ. You know, he was, uh, Paul says, uh, in Afrikaans say to me, he says, Gegrijp dier Christus. He went, Christus het my gevat. You know, uh, he, he was a prisoner of Christ. Uh, 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 he sees himself in that way. You know, Paul has got all these ways that he sees things. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And now he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. You know, uh, he, he, he kind of um, subjected himself. He kind of 
put himself under God. He actually sees himself as captured by God, a prisoner of God. He's enwrapped himself so much in God that he's, he's, he's given himself up completely. You know, that's why Paul was such a powerful uh, minister of the gospel. You know, and as I was reading, reading about Paul, and um, William was also talking about Paul, you know, I, th I thought that we should not, you know, so many times Paul is such a powerful person in the Bible, but we are not worshipping Paul. Paul says, uh, some people follow Apollos and some this, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, but don't follow them, follow Christ, you know. So, he says, a prisoner for, the, for you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the. I can't actually begin. Unless to be fair, after on Tom Dahl, and then we'll let begin. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. So he's talking about this mystery. You'll hear he's always talking about this mystery, and he says he talks about the mystery that now the Jews are one that he was talking about before. That we are all one in Christ. So he's talking about this mystery, and we're gonna to go to why what is this ministry? What is the main focus of this ministry? What a mystery and ministry, why God has kept it secret for so long. So he says, Surely you have heard about uh, the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly in the readings. Uh, in, 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 uh, briefly, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. So he keeps on talking about this mystery of Christ, um, which was not made, made known to men in order in, in other generations, and it, as it now has been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ. So the mystery is that now the Gentiles also are included. We are part of this body. And that's what he was talking about in previously. All right. So let's start with verse 7. He says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. I became a servant of this gospel. I think all of us need to realize that there's a calling upon our lives. And Paul, I said, now, now he saw himself as a prisoner for God, you know. He saw, saw himself for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So long I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So he had this surrendered life. And now he comes and he says, I'm a servant of this gospel. I, my life is there to serve this gospel of the good news. My life is, uh, I am here because I am a servant. You know, and, and he had such a powerful um, uh, outlook on it. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of, uh, the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. And he talks about the grace of God. You know, all of us has got a grace in a certain area. Uh, William was also t uh, t touching on that. Every one of us are called with different gifts. You have some grace upon your life to be a pro prophet or to be prophetic. You can be prophetic without being a prophet, not prophetic. You can be prophetic without being a prophet, you know. And uh, you can be evangelistic without being an evangelist. You can be a pastor without being a pastor. You know, you can do pastoral care, take care of people. And all those gifts, there are levels of it, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, Paul comes and he says that I became a servant of this gospel by the grace. There was special grace upon his life. And he saw it as a privilege to be by the grace of God that he had this privilege of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. I remember when I went into Africa preaching there for the first time and so on and preaching to those people, you know, I kind of experienced what Paul was uh, saying, you know, we, we are always uh, between them, um, ministering to the white people and uh, uh, South Africans and so on. And then going into Africa and preaching to the black people, um, it was, it's not the same, but it was kind of the same feeling, you know, you always minister to your own people. And now you come to this different nation and different people. And in my head, I was always seeing myself, we were kind of like the Jews. <laughs> and, and then we go to the Gentiles, you know, you kind of can see that. But it's not like that. 
We are all Gentiles, but and we are separate from the Jews, but now we are one. He says, um, so if by the grace of God, through the working of His power, verse 8, Although I am less than the least of God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So Paul comes and he says, there's a grace upon his life to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable uh, goodness of God. As I said, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There's so much in Christ. There's so much for them to know about Christ. The Jews kind of knew a lot about God, but there was so much to know about Christ. And Paul says, yes, God, this, this uh, uh, gift and this grace to preach it to them. So he was excited about that. But also Paul is starting to speak about something much deeper than just what we are seeing now. You know, we just think that we are one and we became part of the body and so on and so on. But he's kind of delving and I was preparing and reading into this and trying to see more and, and I don't know if I'll be able to bring out what I've what I see but he comes to that place in verse 8 and he says a uh, B part he says to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ there's so much in Christ that they don't know and that he wants to explain it to them and then he carries on in verse 9 and to make plain to every everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things so he's talking about this mystery again that has been kept secret it's like God had this uh, card against his chest that he never showed anybody else he just kept it to himself and Paul has got the grace to teach about this card against his chest Paul is the one to be able to speak about this and that being that now everyone can come to God. All right. So let's look at this. He says, uh, 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 verse ten. His intent was that now through the church. His intent was that now through the church. His intent. His intention. His plan. His purpose was that now through the church. And you know, when we read that, you must realize that's a calling. That now through the church. Are you a part of the church? That now through the church, that's a calling. That's a, 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 a calling to ministry. He says, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That now through the church, the mystery of God should be made known to the principalities and powers and rulers of the air. So in other words, we must make known this mystery of Christ to the world, to, 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 to the world and the principalities and powers. The demons, uh, I, I looked that up, he talks about it could be angels and the, uh, the forces of darkness. That we should make known to them something. That we should preach to them something. That we as the church has got the mandate, the commandment, the vision, the, the uh, calling to preach to the principalities and powers. Think about that. That you should make something known to them. There's something that they need to learn that they don't know. And we are going to teach it to them. We are going to show it to them. And not just the principalities and powers, but in the world. And God is calling the whole of the church. He's actually calling man to his back to his original purpose with Adam. Adam was created in God's image and likeness. He was created to be like God. He had authority. He could speak to uh, things and, and call names to things. He was created in God's image and likeness. He was like God when he was created. There was something, he was just a little bit lower than the angel says the Bible. You know, and he, 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 there was something about Adam that was so powerful. Because God didn't create the angels in his image and likeness. He created Adam in his image and likeness. So God had a purpose and a plan for man. And that plan was distorted by the enemy, distorted by the works of the enemy. And, and he came and he, uh, he attacked, he, he, he rebelled against God and he overthrew the kingdom of God and the things of God. And he messed up all God's plans. And then Jesus came. God said he sent his only son into the world. And when Jesus came, he broke the power of the enemy. 
the power that they, of sin over Adam, the power that he had over man, he broke that power and he released man through the church now and through the Holy Spirit indwelling us where the church dispensation started, he released man to step into what he has for man. This is so powerful. So he says his intent was, and we're back to that verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. I actually saw that in the Amplified. I can't remember now exactly how it went there. But the manifold wisdom, the intentions of God, the, 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 the full plan, the full idea that God had. Uh, we always see, uh, I always talk about a manifold. In a car, you get a manifold where... The air flows in through the carburetor or in through the inlet manifold. It flows into all the cylinders, you know. So it's manifold. It spreads out. It, it, it gives air to everything and fuel to every piston. And then it fires and a manifold pushes it out again on the other side into the exhaust pipe and it goes. But he talks about this manifold wisdom. It's all the dimensions of God's wisdom is given to the church to spread, to teach, and to reveal, and to uh, uh, preach it to the, to the principalities and powers. All right? His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers, authorities in the heavenly realms, according to this eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this purpose was accomplished through Christ Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, He died for sin, He paid the price, He, gave, he brought us in, back into relationship with God, back into covenant with God, He brought us, He revealed, He overpowered, and He overcame the works of the enemy, and all these things. That the, the, so He made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to His eternal purpose, and that was His eternal purpose, says the Bible. It was something that He had in mind eternally. It's always been in His mind. It always has always been His plan, and it will always be His plan. So if people come against what the church and come against what God wants to do, and I'm not talking about a building, I'm talking about the body of Christ, then they are coming against God's eternal purpose. And He says, um, according to his eternal purpose, who he, who, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And verse 12, in him, and now I, 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 he's saying what he wants to say. This is the purpose. This is what he wants to do. He says, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. All this was done so that we can approach God again with freedom and confidence. Like Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden with God in the morning and in the evening, in the cool of the day. They walked with God. They had relationship with God. They could speak to God. He could speak to Him. They were confident before God. They could confidently uh, communicate and speak to God. It, this is what prayer should be like. It should be confidently <coughs> speaking to God, having fellowship with God, having relationship with God. You know, And this is what God wants us as the church to make known to the world and to the principalities of, of, and powers of the air that we can confidently come to God, speak to God, have a relationship with God. As I was saying in the communion, to lie at a table with Him. You know, to speak to Him. When you are busy with whatever you are doing, you can speak to God. You can have this relationship with God. It's powerful. And that with a God that is so powerful, so mighty, that has created all things, that has started everything. We have the privilege of having that relationship with Him and to make known to the principalities and the powers the freedom and confidence, with freedom and confidence. Now he continues, and then Paul kind of messes the whole thing up in verse 16. He says, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. You know, and to me, you read this whole thing that we are the church and we must preach to the principalities and powers and we must tell them and we explain to them and show them and all these things. And then suddenly he comes and he, he says, I ask therefore that you, you're not discouraged because of my uh, sufferings for you, which are your glory. What he's actually saying is that, and he's bringing this in so strategically where he says, 
So don't be discouraged by what I'm suffering. Don't be discouraged by what I'm going through. You are called to preach. You are called to speak. You are called to bring these things and show the world and show every uh, principality and power uh, this relationship that you should have with God. That it's so powerful. It's so uh, the fullness of God is going to get into that just now. You know, everything that God has for us and in store for us. But he, he comes and he says, so don't be discouraged by what I'm going through. And so many times we build such a doctrine around our suffering for Christ and what we are going through for Christ. But what Paul was saying is that he went through this for the church. It's for their glory. It's for their strengthening. Not that everyone should struggle and suffer for the gospel. Yes, there are times where you're going to suffer for the gospel. You know, where you're going to speak it in a place where nobody wants to hear it. And they're not going to like it. But that's what Paul did. That's what he actually says. That's what, that's what I did. I came and preached this gospel to the Jews that the Gentiles are included. I came to speak this gospel that everyone can serve Christ and be in Christ. Uh, uh, even though they were Gentiles serving other gods, they all had the right to be children of God. They are all included. And that, draw pe that drew people from all walks of life to Christianity. That they were included. They didn't have to come with works. They didn't have to come with all these things. Uh, uh, and so on. You know. So. Um, he says. So. I ask you therefore. Do not be discouraged. Because of my sufferings. Don't worry about this. What I'm going through. Don't worry about it. Focus on the big picture. Focus on where we are heading. You know. And so many times. We can get so focused on the trials. And the things that we go for. The go through. That we don't focus on the big picture. So, and then he starts in verse 14. I'm going to read just that last piece there till uh, verse uh, 20, uh, 21. <laughs> he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom this whole family in heaven and on earth derives it na its name. I kneel before the Father. He comes to that place. He says, God has done all this for us. He's given us all this. And for this reason... Uh, because I have this grace to preach this message and that God has given us this calling and this this message to preach to the principalities and powers and all these things he says for this reason I kneel I kneel before the father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name everything started with God that is why he's the father from whom everything derives its name everything came from God he says, he says, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. So He comes and He says that God will strengthen you with power in your inner being, with His Spirit, by His Spirit. But listen to the next verse, verse 17. So that, so there's a reason why He's filling you with this power. There's a reason why He's empowering you and doing these things. He says, so that, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You know, so this whole thing happens so that the whole church, every person, every believer, that Christ can dwell in you through faith. That you are filled with Christ. And I know this is a great one for us, you know. We all know this. He says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, now he comes to love. He says that you're being rooted and established in love. So this whole mystery, this thing that we will be preaching, that we will explain, that we will see is that Christ loved us. God loves us. He gave His Son because He loves us and He wants to bring us back into this relationship, into this love. And that we should be showing the love of God wherever we go. The Bible says love conquers all. The Bible says that God is love. And God's purpose is that as the church, that we be, will become people that is so full of love that it will conquer all. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that they that believe in Him will not perish, but they have everlasting life. So His whole purpose was to love, to show His love. And now we will show the love of God to the principalities and powers. They don't understand it. The world doesn't understand love because love... Uh, uh, or, or if you don't have love, you're all about yourself. 
what uh, you know I I need to be better than this one and I, I'm gonna have more than that one and I'm gonna you know it's all about yourself and that defeats love so love God is love and that we should express God's love and when we continue in chapter 4 Paul is going to explain to the church how they should walk in this unity and in this love what this book is all about is about love and unity and that how we should walk in this unity is going to start from chapter 4 he's going to talk about that the character of God Carla was also touching on that this morning you know the character of God and the personality and whatever you can fake it for so long but uh, you, sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes you can just fake for so long. But eventually people will really see what is in your heart. If there's love in your heart. If there's grace in your heart. If you are a servant of God. If you, if you really, what is in your heart, it eventually will come out. You can't hide it forever. All right. But um, so he's coming to this place and where he talks about the church. And we should walk in the love. You know, God is love. And if you walk in love, you become like Christ. You, you take on that mantle. You take on. And love releases everything. Love actually uh, releases healing. Love releases the word in power. Because you're not preaching it for selfish reason, reasons. You are preaching it to build up, to lift up, to empower, to strengthen people. And God's purpose is that through His Word, that people will be strengthened in His mighty power. That people will grow into the fullness of His character. You know, and, and uh, William was talking about the gifts, you know, that we will be able to speak to things in love. You know, that releases the gift. When the accent was dropped in the water, it was because of the love of the prophet. And uh, this man worried, if, if that accent doesn't, uh, if I can't get it, I borrowed it from someone. I need to give it back. And he said, oh, just take a stick and throw it in the water. And because of his love for this man, and he wanted him to keep his relationship right with that person, he said, take a stick and throw it into water. He, required, he inquired of God. He asked of God, what must I do? How, how can I help this man? And eventually he threw the stick in the water and the accent floated. And a miracle took place. And that was released because of love, because of caring. You know, and we, we release the fullness of God through love. And Paul writes this, he says, in this piece, he says, So don't worry about what I'm going through. It's not a problem. I love you too much. And I want you to understand the love of God. I want you to understand, like, I am going through this and I'm willing to go through this. For it's for your glory. He said, at the end of the day, you will go, you will uh, reach higher heights. At the end of the day, you will experience God. You will come into this relationship with God that's going to be stronger than ever before. You are going to be able to speak to God, have a relationship with Him, love Him. You know, boldly into His throne, boldly come before Him, boldly pray, boldly worship and sing. You know, just sing to God. Wherever you are, you can just sing and He hears you. You know, wherever you are, you can pray and He hears you. That's the relationship that we have with God. We are back where Adam and Eve was. Not Adam and Steve, where Adam and Eve was, you know. We are back to that place where we can speak to God, have relationship with God. And this is the mystery that everyone is included. Jews, Gentiles, Blacks, Whites, Indians, whoever. Everybody is included into this love relationship with God and into a love for one another. And I know maybe love sometimes is like a curse word to some people. You know, uh, 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 one guy once preached, he said, you must just love everybody, like a cow <laughs> licking you. Just love everybody. You know, and, and uh, you know, so many times it's like that. You know, you kind of, uh, people don't like when you talk about love. We always like something that we can talk about, something that's happened or an accident, always the bad stuff. But when it comes to love and so on, then we don't really want to spread that message. But that's why Satan hinders that. He doesn't want that. But if we as children of God grow into the love of God, we will talk about the good things. We will spread the good news. We will uh, uh, love people. We will take care of people. And that will become more popular than the bad news. Amen? So, just to finish off, Ephesians, he says, so that, uh, um, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, 
may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He says, I pray that you will understand how wide and high and long and deep is the love of Christ. So, Paul, the mystery is not just that we are all together. The mystery is that through love, God's going to move in such a powerful way. And that we will, through the love of God, understand, you know, and that the principalities and powers, that we will teach them and show them the love of God. They will see the love of God and to them love because they are focused on evil. They are focused on breaking down. They are focused on breaking up marriages, breaking up relationships, breaking up families. They are focused on the negative stuff because that's what they want to do because they want to hinder the love of God. They want to hinder God from moving through His people. And that's why they are focused. But we will teach them. We will show them what true love is by the power of the Spirit. And Christ being completely formed in us. So as the church, we have a lot of work. Amen. We need to be formed into Christ. We will need to form into that love. We need to understand that love. Grasp that love. And that's what Paul says. I want to teach you this. I want to, this is a mystery. And we don't understand the power of love. There's so much power in it. We think there's power in telling someone their fortune. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's when you walk in love, there's so much power. It breaks even the hardest heart. It touches the hardest heart. He says that you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you may be full to the measure of all the fullness of God. We, uh, the calling is that we will be filled with all the fullness of the measure of God. And God is love. That we will be carriers of God. Carriers of His anointing. Carriers of His presence. Carriers of His character. Wherever we go. Imagine to yourself, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, He showed us how we should be. Jesus walked in the earth, and as He walked, and as He did His thing, He showed love. Wherever He went, love uh, uh, moved Him. The Bible says He was moved with compassion. Where He saw the blind man, He was moved with compassion. Wherever He went, the woman with the issue of blood, He didn't stop because He was angry. He stopped because He was moved by her faith. You know, you think you'll respond this way, but then he responds in love. And every time Jesus responded in love, everyone stood back and they were kind of in awe. Wow. Even his disciples said to the blind man, be quiet. Be quiet. And Jesus said, stop, stop. Call that man. You know, every time he reached out in love, and when he reached out in love, miracles happened. Signs and wonders followed. God moved in such a powerful way. And every time it was all surrounded by love. Even when he hung up on the cross. And they, they nailed him to the cross. They, they said bad things about him. They said all kinds of stuff. And they, uh, uh, you know, uh, all those things that they did. Still he hung on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. You know, he forgave. So he manifested to the principalities and the powers. He showed them what love is. And that's why their power was broken over him. Because where God should have punished us, should have hated us, should have killed us for everything that we've done to his son and done to him, he still reached out and Jesus came and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. You know, and as believers, we should have that attitude. Father, forgive them. When they sin against you, already forgive them. When they say things against you, you already forgive them. You don't carry anything. You do not keep records of wrong. You just love them. And it's the love of God that draws man to repentance. It's the love of God that will shake them, that will change them. You know, I've met many people in my life that has been hostile towards me. But in time, they become my friends. Make many people in my life that, that because of love, you can just overcome. It's so powerful. There's so much power. I just want to finish up. So then, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. 
and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge it surpasses knowledge sometimes you cannot understand love you you know uh, sometimes you'll get to a place where people will think you'll respond in anger then you respond in love no matter what they've done you will just respond in love it surpasses understanding sometimes for myself you know when I was in Bible school I prayed I said I prayed for hours and all I asked God father fill me with the love of Christ fill me with the love of Christ for people the love of God for people and sometimes when I have a right to be angry with someone who sells my boat and don't give me the money you know someone who I do a trip with a truck and go and do hundreds and thousands of kilometers and they don't pay me then so sometimes it surpasses my mind why I'm not angry with them why I just feel sorry for them because it's the love of God you know it surpasses your understanding sometimes you won't understand why do you love this person they don't need your love they actually don't earn your they don't deserve your love but somehow you just forgive them you just love them you just see something in them that God sees and that nobody else maybe sees and that is what's going to break them the prophecy over my love is that even the hardest heart will be touched and I'm not there yet <laughs> but it's what the Bible says even the hardest heart will be touched Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. That power of love that is in us will cause us to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think or even imagine. If you walk in the love of God, God will manifest Himself through you. If you walk in the love of God, God will prove Himself to you. And He will prove Himself to the people around you. And He will prove Himself to the principalities and powers of the air that love conquers all. And that He's always been a God of love. That He gave His only Son. So they that believe in Him will not perish but have eternal life. It's so powerful. He says, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Keep every measure that you can, no matter how far you can measure, deep, height, length, whatever, His love surpasses all that. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think, the Amplified says, even imagine, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever more. To Him be glory in the church. That He will be glorified in the church. That His glory will be manifested in the church. That we will be people that will be filled with the love of God. You know, even the Roman Empire was destroyed because of love. These Christians were persecuted. They were killed. But they never fought back. They just loved them. Um, so love conquers all. And I want to encourage you as the church, and we're going to look at the next part where he talks about the character. We're going to look at that. And I want to encourage you in your prayer, pray that God will show you love. Pray that God will teach you love. Pray that you will have love for the people around you. Because that is the mystery. That is the secret. That everybody is included in this. And that we should include everyone into this. Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we just come to you this morning. And Father, maybe I've spoken long this morning, but Lord, I pray that you will just come and touch us this morning and help us to realize, Father, that it's the love of God that draws man to repentance. Father, that we cannot come in our own ability and strength and might and the things that we do. It's the love of God that compels them to good works. And Father, we pray that you will empower us by your grace, Father, and we will be able to declare to the principalities and powers, not just through words, but through character and through the lifestyle and through the way that we act, that the love of God, because it is the love of God that's going to conquer all. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.